um, high and the meeting is being recorded. Um, so later we will post the videos on YouTube. Um, so let me restart. So thank you for being here for our first high energy seminar of this fall semester. Um, I'm Ana Trindade Falcão and with Federico that is not here today. Um, we first would like to welcome the two new members of the organizing committee, Constantina and Ife. And um, so today we start with a talk by Melissa Ewing, Ewing yeah. on detecting fast stochastic polarization variability in X-ray sources. So just a brief uh, bio, Melissa is a second year PhD student specializing in X-ray astronomy at Newcastle University in England. Um, she is originally from Aberdeen, Scotland, and she began, began her studies with an integrated master's degree in physics and astronomy at the University of Glasgow in Scotland as well. Um, working alongside Dr. Adam Ingram, she's an IXP uh, science team member working to uh, actualize new diagnosis to study accreting, accreting compact objects and break the genesis in the leading models of their phenomena. Welcome. Thanks so much. I'll give you a five minute uh, warning. Sure. Thanks. You should turn off the spotlights here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much for everyone gathering today. Um, I'm Melissa and I'm going to be talking about my PhD work, which is detecting plastic acid polarization very We have two microphones sure. if you want. This one you just go up. Sure. That one? Okay. Great. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I'll be talking about my PhD work, which is detecting plastic acid polarization variability in X ray sources. So, as it turns out, I'm from Aberdeen, Scotland, um, in the northeast, and it's called the Granite City. Um, it might be pretty grey from the pictures, but the locals will tell you that it shines in the sun. So. Um, and then I moved to Glasgow to do my integrated masters, and then that led me to Newcastle University, where I'm now in England working with Adam Ingram. So my studies are primarily focused on X-ray binaries, which are systems with a compact object, either a black hole, a neutron star, sometimes a white dwarf, and a normal star from which the compact object is increasing from. And the infall of this material causes these objects to get really hot and glow brightly in X-rays. And they go through different spectral states depending on the accretion. And in the hard state, so when the spectrum is dominated by um, the very energetic bosons, um, we find that this flux is coming from a region that we call the corona, which is a cloud of hot free electrons around the inner accretion flow. Um, since this corona is too small to be spatially resolved, we need to come up with different ways in order to break some of the degeneracies in the modeling of the corona. So, um, so recently we've only had the energy of the photons and the arrival times and so we can do some spectral analysis and timing analysis but not much else up until around 2021 with the um, imaging x-ray polarimetry explorer we now have two new binary diagnostics in order to study these um, systems so we have the polarization degree so what percentage of the photons are polarized and the polarization angle so the angle at which they are polarized and the way IHPE works, it has three gas pixel detector units on board, and a photon is instant on one of these detectors, and it enters a volume of helium, and it interacts with this helium creating a photoelectron, and it's the direction of this photoelectron that encodes the polarization information of an observation. So, if we build up a histogram of these um, modulation angles, which is the direction, um, what we use to measure the direction of the boson, um, we find that it's proportional to the modulation function, which is this equation up here. So if we have a source that's polarized, then we find that this modulation function is proportional to a cos-squared shape, and so the height of the cos-squared shape is corresponding to the polarization degree, and where it is on the modulation angle axis corresponds to the polarization angle. And so if we have a completely unpolarized source, then we're going to find that there's no dependence on modulation angle with counts, and so we're just going to get a completely flat response that you see here. 
So we've already been using IHP to do some pretty cool stuff with X-ray binaries. Um, these are the results from the observation of Sigmix X1, which is a persistent X-ray binary. Um, it's always observed in the hard state, never goes into the essence. And so we measure the polarization degree to be about 4%, um, the polarization angle to be about minus 20 degrees. Um, what we also find is that the polarization angle is um, aligned with the radio jet. And so the way the polarization works, if the polarization angle is aligned with something, then that means that the emission region, so the corona in this case, because we're dominated in the hard state, is perpendicular to that angle. So we find that the corona is aligned with the disk. So we've already been using IHP to break some of the geometries of these models and sort of tell us more about the geometry of our corona. So my work is focused on the variability of extra binaries. Um, they're variable on many different types of scales. Um, but I'm particularly interested in QPOs, which are quasi-periodic oscillations. So on the left here is um, a light curve of an extra binary with a QPO on it. Um, it's sometimes difficult to see what's going on properly, so it can be much easier to move over to the Fourier domain to do this analysis. So on the right here, we have a power spectrum of an extra binary light curve with um, type C QPO. And the QPO is the broad big peak there. And the type C basically just means that it's on top of this broadband noise. And that little secondary peak there is just um, harmonics of the fundamental, which you sometimes see with type C QPOs as well. So the origin of these QPOs since their observation has not been well understood. Um, there's been many models that are going around, um, but we've not had much information apart from the arrival times and energy of the photons to really break the degeneracies between them. Um, one of the leading theories is lens theory precession. So in lens theory precession, if we have matter that's misaligned with the spin axis of the black hole, then we're going to find that it, it um, gyroscopically notably not precesses around this given axis. So this is because of the um, frame dragging effect around the spinning black hole, which is creating this precession. So this, one, um, this model predicts um, flux QPOs, which is what we observe, and we observe the lens during frequency is commensurate to the QPO frequencies we see, which is between about 0.1 and 30 hertz. Um, but we also find that the lens during precession model predicts polarization QPOs. So we also find that the polarization degree and polarization angle are modulated over this QPO. And on the right here is um, the processing of the corona. So as you can imagine, the flux getting dimmer and brighter over the QPO phase. And the black lines here are the, um, well, the light ones, the polarization degree. So that's changing over QPO phase because of the way that constant scattering is working in the corona. And the um, actual geometry of the corona moving around is changing this polarization angle over the QPO phase. So, in order to try to detect these polarization QPOs, we might be thinking to just make a light curve like we did with the flux and tell whether or not there's a QPO. But unfortunately, polarization is measured in a statistical sense. So, we need a certain number of photons per time then in order to statistically accurately measure the polarization properties. And so the um, equation at the top there um, tells us the minimum detectable polarization. And if we throw in a few of the typical values of an X-ray binary, so a count rate of about 100 tens per second, 10% um, polarization, which is actually quite high, we find that the time that we need in order to measure the polarization is about four minutes. And that's far longer than the sub-second time scales that we're interested in. So we can't build up these light curves and we need to find a different way in order to measure this polarization variability. Another potential method would have been phase folding, but with phase folding, um, you need to assign a phase to each and every event in the observation. And with periodic signals, this can be very easy because the um, phase just moves linearly over time. But with a quasi-periodic oscillation, we're going to find that it moves basically in a Gaussian random walk around this linear increase. So again, it makes it difficult to assign a phase to each observation or each um, photon. So again, we need to come up with a different way in order to measure our variability. 
So if we think back to the modulation function, if we have a source that has only a flux QPO with no polarization variability, we're going to find that over the QPO phase, the flux is just going to move up and down, and the function will have um, a constant peak and not be moving anywhere except for up and down on the current axis. So if we were to take any um, two modulation angle bins, then we're going to find that these move with the same RMS and the same phase as each other over the QPO phase. Just like that. <laughs> And if we instead have a QPO in the flux as well as the polarization properties, then we're going to find that we get a stretching and squeezing of the modulation function um, as it moves up the QPO phase, as well as a shifting of left to right of the peak and the modulation angle axis. So now we're going to take um, any arbitrary modulation angle bins, they're no longer going to move in the same RMS and the same phase as each other. And it's this variability that's available to us, and it's this variability that we use to detect polarization variability. So I should mention here as well that it's completely model independent, so we, it doesn't matter what kind of variability we're looking at, whether it's periodic, aperiodic, or quasi-periodic. We are always going to find that there is um, a change in RMS in phase with modulation angle. And it uses a Fourier technique, um, so if you're familiar with spectral timing analysis at all, the RMS and phase plots are quite similar to what you'd expect um, in those studies, but instead of choosing energy bins, we're choosing modulation angle bins. So we now have a really nice way to um, test whether or not there's polarization variability, and it gives us a null hypothesis test where if there is variability, then we're going to see a sinusoidal dependence in RMS and phase over modulation angle and a flat response like the blue, one, blue line otherwise. So we wanted to come up with a way to test our methods without actually knowing whether or not polarization QBOs exist. And so we decided to apply the method to X-ray sources where we already know that there's polarization variability, and that's pulsars. So IHP has observed several pulsars, and these are the results for RxJ040 and Hercules X1. So I can use the typical phase folding methods in this case because the flux and the properties move um, as we expect over the pulse phase. And so um, I can phase fold the flux with the degree polarization angle, and we can clearly see that there is variability over the pulse phase. So now that we have this information without using our methods, we can apply it and see whether or not we can rediscover this variability. And so that's just what I did. Um, here are the results for Hercules X1. On the left here, we have the power spectrum, where you can see a very strong peak at the pulse frequency and the corresponding harmonics. And when we focus our analysis onto this pulse frequency, we are able to reconstruct the sinusoidal dependence that tells us that there is a variability there. So with 6.81 sigma statistical significance, we can say yes, there is this variability, and we didn't need to look at the um, pulse phase plots in order to test that. So again, here's another um, version for RxJ0 for zero, and we get a really nice 180 degree modulation here. And that's just because the pulsar is slower, and so we get more counts per pulse in order to give us a better signal to noise. So we're very strongly able to show that we get a good um, detection here. So I've been further able to consolidate the methods by running some simulations, and I'm able to inject any type of polarization variability that I like. So I decided to re-inject the true polarization variability that's there and test our RMS and phase and once again we get what we expect, um, this 180 degree modulation. So some of you might know about SWIFT J1727, um, it was a recently outbursting extra binary that was very bright, about 7 crab. Um, this was last year and it shows a very strong type C, type C QBO which is on the left there. Um, but well, applying the methods, unfortunately, at this time, well, unfortunately, I don't find a polarization QPO, but this doesn't rule out the last bearing precession model, but instead allows us to um, apply some other limits on what we expect from the model. 
So on the left here, um, from the further methods, we're able to reconstruct the flux, polarization degree, and polarization angle modulation over the QBO phase. And for two sigma, we have an um, RMS and polarization angle of about 2.8 degrees. And the plot on the right here is the inclination of the source that we expect from the lens theory model. And so I go on the plot here with a 2.8 um, polarization angle. We find that we get an inclination um, requiring an inclination of 365 degrees. And this was calculated for a truncation radius of um, 20 RG and a misalignment axis of our chroma of 15 degrees. So we can test whether or not we expect an inclination like this from the real source um, and test whether or not whether we can um, rule out the lens theory precession model or not. So basically, in conclusion, um, IHPE has given us two binary diagnostics um, for our extra binaries, the polarization degree and polarization angle. And we can use this to test the um, models of the origin of the source of type C QPOs. And for the moment, we haven't quite got the source that we want to show us the data, but we can put some other limits on the observations that we have for the moment, and hope in the future that we get some good observations. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Thanks, Melissa. Great talk. Um, I, just thinking about this, um, the, if, if you have a, a non-detection with XP of a particular uh, source that has QPOs, to me this suggests that you might be able to tease out uh, a, a detection by looking for this modulation and actually, um, it, because the modulation itself would be diluting uh, or, or tending to depolarize the uh, time integrated signal. So is, is that in fact going to be a practical way to search for um, uh, uh, polarization detection in sources where right now we only have upper limits or do you think that's too much in the margin? Um, I think it will be okay to use this method because we are just focused on the on the QPO frequency itself. Um, so the depolarization doesn't affect too much of the modulations that we're trying to measure. Any other questions? Hi, Melissa. Thanks for the great talk. Um, for Swift J17 and 27, I believe there are some uh, estimates on the inclination uh, from uh, projection spectroscopy as well, and they tend to be towards uh, lower inclination. Do you see a tension there with your estimate? It could well be, yeah. Um, for this, that, so, but, um, for that plot, the um, truncation radius was about 20 RG, which also affects what the um, polarization modulations would be. So we could run this code for different um, observations and maybe then that would help this tension. But yeah, it could be a problem, but we should run this code for more parameters and find out. Thank you. Um, so, I, are you staying here for the week uh, and the CFA? Um, it's just today. Okay, so we have time slots, I think, still to be the speaker. In case you have any further questions, we, we can hold up. So, let's thank her again. Yeah, we, we set this up.
Let me introduce the second speaker. So our second speaker of today is Priyanka Sharma. And she'll be giving a talk on the effects of super radiance in uh, AGMs. So Priyanka is a postdoc fellow at National Tsinghua University in Taiwan, specializing in we can check. You're going to have to share your screen and <laughs> um, She's specializing in theoretical astroparticle physics, and her current research interests include astrophysical probes such as AGN as a possible site to look for new uh, physics in light of upcoming observations, such as from uh, LSST. DESI and cosmological probes like the global 21 centimeter line to gauge the particle nature of dark matter. Uh, and recently she has been exploring how ultralight scalar fields might impact AGM characteristics through the phenomenon of black hole super radiance. So, welcome. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Anna for the introduction. And uh, hi everyone, I'm Priyanka from National Tsinghua University, Taiwan. And today I'll be speaking on my recent work on the effects of superheatings in active galactic nuclei. And this work uh, was in collaboration with Manchu Verma, Kim Manchu, and Dushu All right, so uh, let's get started. So uh, as you may know that uh, there's a rotating, uh, okay, do we have this pointer? So as you may know that the rotating black holes, um, uh, supermassive black holes, it's, it can open up and move for the ultralight scalar particles to get produced to, through a very intriguing phenomenon known as superradiance. So superradiance, in simple words, is a phenomenon where when this bosonic particles, it enters into a specific region of this spinning black hole, the outcome is that the exponential growth of the particles around the black hole. And this happens at the cost of the angular momentum of the black hole. Hmm. Now, if you have a, a huge cloud of particles around the black hole, the question is, where do you see it? And where do you see the effect of uh, the fact that the black hole is losing its angular momentum? So one observation, um, one uh, signature of super radiance, uh, is the uh, is the formation of depletion region that can be uh, observed in the spin versus mass plane of the black hole. So as I mentioned that uh, because of superheating, the black hole will spin down and it will uh, settle at a critical value. So the prediction is that black holes, um, black holes in this uh, in this region, they will uh, after spinning down, they will either lie along this critical spin curve or they will lie below this critical spin curve. Okay. So in a way, you can say that the black holes from this region are getting depleted away and hence the name goes as depletion region. Now, uh, um, if you observe a black hole inside or within this um, depletion region, then such observation can place a bound on the uh, existence of the scalar particle. Okay. So now, uh, such observation of depletion region, it requires precise measurement of the spin of the black holes. And such measurement is best possible when the black hole is embedded in some kind of realistic environment. For example, like when the black hole is surrounded by a luminous accretion disk. And the best example for this case is the example of active galactic nuclei. So we have these supermassive black holes at the core of this active galactic nuclei that accretes matter in the form of accretion disk. So now when we talk about superradians in active galactic nuclei, there are mainly two points to be uh, to, to, to be remembered. Number one is the role of accretion, that is to add mass and angular momentum to the black hole. And uh, and now it is that there are currently now two competing processes. One is the spinning up of the black hole due to accretion, and other is the spinning down of the black hole due to the super radiance. And um, in, the, in the absence of precise measurement, in the absence of good statistics of the precise measurement of the spins of the black hole, 
it is worthwhile to ask the question whether we can look for this ultralight scalar particles using the observable characteristics of the AGNs. And in this work, we address this question. Uh, um, so I'll just briefly, I'll just quickly uh, flesh out the key findings that we have obtained. So what we have observed is that uh, as the FPP supremacy black holes, they spin down due to super radians, uh, we observed a sudden drops in the time variation of different band luminosities. And also we have observed this um, formation of this depletion region, as well as the accumulation of this agent along the boundaries of this region in various um, planes of band luminosities and Eddington ratio. So before going to the detail of the work, let's very quickly have a uh, understanding of the, the uh, condition under which this superagents occurs. So uh, the superagents phenomena it occurs when the angular velocity of the particle is less than the angular velocity of the black hole at the horizon. And the consequence, as I mentioned, that it's a consequence is the um, large growth of the scalar particles around the black hole, and which, occur, which happens at the cost of this, uh, uh, at the cost of the fact that the black hole is losing its mass and angular momentum. <coughs> and the black hole will continue to lose its angular momentum till it settles at this um, critical value, which is given by, which, is, which can be parameterized by this parameter alpha, uh, known as this gradation fine structure constant, given as the product of the black hole mass and the scalar mass mu. Now, um, now we will see. We will first see how the whole system of the cloud and the black hole will evolve uh, with time in the presence of a particular scalar field. And to know that, uh, we have um, uh, we have solved this couple differential equation, uh, assuming a simple accretion model. Uh, so the total luminosity of uh, of this um, agent that, uh, that that can be determined by this quantity, uh, this radiative efficiency. So this quantity will tell you how much of the matter will be radiated away from the disk and how much of the matter will be going into the fate of the black hole. And um, so now uh, the other important parameter is this dimensionless accretion rate, which is small m dot. And that can be obtained by uh, parameterizing in terms of this uh, maximum luminosity, which is this additive luminosity. And now combining all this, we get this uh, efficient black hole efficient rate in terms of this radiative efficiency and uh, dimensionless efficient rate parameter. Now let's first see how the uh, how the um, time evolution looks like for an isolated black hole, which we shown uh, in this plot. So the first plot shows the spin evolution. And the second plot shows the evolution of the cloud. So uh, for an isolated black hole, what we see is that the black hole spins down and it settles at this critical value. And after that, it will it will um, no more it, it will have no more growth, no more evolving time. And during this uh, spin down, the cloud will grow. Uh, the cloud will grow, and the cloud can maximum it can grow maximum up to ten percent of the initial black hole mass. And this feature of this isolated black hole is in quite contrast with the case of uh, case of an accreting black hole. So where uh, we have shown by this red line. So in case of accreting black hole, you can see that the black hole spins down initially, and now because of accretion, the uh, it will spin up until it reaches the next mode of superradiance, and followed by which. It will again the speed will again rise because of the accretion. So this is a um, um, different distinct feature of accretion that we can see uh, for the superagents in uh, accreting black hole. And uh, in for the cloud uh, for the growth of the cloud, we can see that there is a boost in this cloud growth that is purely coming from accretion, and and boost uh, and that can be understood like this. That um, as I mentioned, that because of super radius, the black hole will try to uh, settle down at the critical value. But now, because of accretion, it, it cannot exactly settle down at the critical value. Rather, it will it will hover slightly above the critical value. So therefore, um, uh, so therefore, the super radius condition will now be uh, now be satisfied for a longer period of time, such that the cloud can grow. 
uh, for a longer period of time. And finally, the cloud collapses because of the emission of gravitational wave uh, uh, that we have shown in this bottom plot. So uh, I'm not be focusing more on this science condition because the main question that we have addressed is that how the characteristics of the AGN will get changed in presence of a scalar field. So uh, to know that, um, um, to know that we have considered this uh, Lobic of Tron model for the efficient disk to get this uh, spin dependent flux uh, and the spectrum we are showing in this two plots. So let's just focus on this uh, left plot where we are showing this uh, showing the spectrum uh, for different uh, spins of the uh, black hole and for a particular mass of the black hole. So as the okay, so from here you can see that as the black hole spins down, that means uh, as you move from this light blue to the dark blue, you can see that the spectrum is getting squeezed from this uh, lower wavelength band. So that means that <coughs> there is this depletion of this higher energy photons from the accretion disk as the black hole spins down. So the prediction is that um, the higher energy band will be will have uh, will have more prominent effect of super radiance. And that is exactly we have we can see in this um, luminosity plots, band luminosity plot. So where we are showing this EV and X-ray luminosity for uh, seeing uh, benchmark points. Uh, so uh, uh, here we can observe this first. You can observe this uh, for all these initial spins. You can observe this sudden drops uh, in this time dilution of luminosity, and this drops. Um, uh, uh, this drops occurs at different time scales, which uh, and this time scales corresponding correspond to the different modes of super radiance that we have considered. And this time scale further can be characterized by the uh, mass of the scalar particle. So, in presence of this scalar particle, hence we uh, hence we expect to see uh, this sudden drops in this uh, band luminosities. And then uh, the then we also observe this similar uh, uh, feature in this uh, Eddington ratio, um, Eddington ratio illumination, which is nothing but the ratio of this total luminosity and the Eddington luminosity. So, in absence of any scalar field, uh, the expectation is that this Eddington ratio will increase with time due to accretion. But now, in the presence of the scalar field, we get this drops at different epochs because of the presence of this scalar field. All right, so now this is the picture when you talk about a particular benchmark point. Now the question is, what's the, uh, how do the distribution of the uh, black holes will change in presence of a scalar field? So, uh, so to know that, uh, we start with this initial uh, uniform distribution of the black holes in the spin versus mass plane. And uh, so, uh, so we have shown, so the left plot shows the evolution uh, for of the black holes, uh, for, for the isolated black holes, and the right plot shows the evolution of the accreting black holes. And uh, assuming that all the black holes have a constant accretion rate parameter. Um, so, uh, and now the expectation or the prediction is that the black holes uh, within, this, uh, uh, within this red curve will get depleted, and that's what we can see uh, over time that. The, uh, sorry. the black holes uh, within this uh, region is getting depleted, and finally uh, they are getting aligned. Sorry. Finally, they are getting aligned along this, along the boundary of this depletion region. And um, this is one point. The other point is that you can see that the most prominent effect is can be seen for this accreting uh, black hole. Uh, the depletion region is more prominent for the accreting black hole. Uh, and the, uh, that can be understood from the fact that because of accretion now, the population of black holes that were initially not super radiant active, now because of accretion, they can be dragged towards this depletion region. And hence, finally, those population can also undergo super radiance and uh, can align themselves along this uh, along the boundary of this region. So now, with this uh, initial distribution of the spin um, and the mass, uh, we we see how the uh, how the how the black holes are distributed in various planes of the luminosity and Eddington ratio. So we start uh, uh, we start looking at this uh, with this non-uniform distribution. 
of these black holes in various uh, band luminosities and the Eddington uh, ratio for again assuming that all the black holes are having a constant uh, attrition rate parameter. And then uh, what you see is that in the uh, in the presence of uh, in the presence of this um, uh, presence of a particular scalar field of say 10 power minus 19 electron volt, what we observe is this uh, what we observe is this formation of this depletion region in various uh, band luminosity planes, mm -hmm. and which is kind of more prominent in this, for example, say X-ray versus IR or X-ray versus UV. And also uh, the accumulation of these black holes along the specific uh, trajectories that can be that can be characterized by the mass of the scalar particle. All right. So uh, now, um, so the main message that we want to give from this plot, or overall in general from this work, is that in the in the uh, in lack of impressive. Um, data of precise spin measurements. Um, this superradiance modified, uh, the superradiance modified luminosity relations, it can be used as a complementary probe of the ultralight scalar particles in the universe, which have 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 not been explored yet. So yeah. So with this, um, I just leave the summary. Uh, summary up to you and what we have observed is this uh, first for a particular benchmark one we have observed this multiple dips in the luminosity evolution in presence of a scalar field and uh, for the distribution we have observed this depletion region and accumulation of along the boundaries of depletion region for in the different uh, planes of band luminosities and Eddington ratio. Uh, yeah and thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, we have questions. Thanks. That was a really fascinating talk. Um, I, I just wanted to uh, mention that there's been some uh, work on with GRMHD simulations by uh, uh, Sasha Chikovskoy, uh, Angelo Ricarte, and some others showing. Um, the, yeah, that you can also spin down um, a black hole by jets, and I'm guessing that uh, you know the sort of corrugated structure you're predicting in mass versus spin can't come about from a, you know a, a Blanford's night process or something. But I, I wonder if you have thought about how accounting for jet emission might modify some of your curves, or um, if there if if those features are, are the best telltale signatures of super radiance versus uh, Jet spin down, or, or um, how you can tease those two effects out from one another. Uh, well, uh, thank you so much. That's a great question. Um, so, uh, although we haven't uh, considered this jet emission process in this, so what uh, what we have found is that jet emission is more prominent for the uh, for the agents which have in the uh, super Eddington uh, case, uh, but. We can, uh, but in our case, we are kind of safe because we are playing in the sub Eddington case. But uh, and also, uh, but even if you are in the super Eddington case, yes, it's it's interesting to see the interplay of this jet emission because then this will be an another competing process of spin down with the super radius. Uh, but one concern is that uh, we need to uh, care about is that uh, if you are considering this. Um, uh, super Eddington case, then whether this agents will have enough time to, you know, uh, to basically swipe the uh, parameter range in, in, in its lifetime. So that is one concern that we have. So, uh, yeah, but we haven't really uh, talked about or explored this thing in this work. Okay. Any further questions? What are depletion regions due to? I mean, what is, what is the you know the source of particles? Let me put it in those terms. Um, source of particles. Yeah, the particles that are being considered to produce the super radiance. Oh, okay. So, so uh, but, but then you were you were talking about depletion, mm -hmm. and what depletes? And what what stops the flow? Let me put it in those terms. 
well, uh, so this particles, uh, so you can consider it to be, say, um, uh, say for example, edition-like particles, which are there. And you can also consider that these particles can form a part of the dark matter. So this is a different part. And uh, regarding this diffusion region uh, is that, um, so because of this diffusion region uh, occurs because that because of the fact that um, this black holes within this region it will spin down, right? So it will spin down in presence of this uh, scalar particle, and then it will settle down at a critical value. Okay. So uh, and after that, after that, uh, once it reaches the critical value, the superradiance condition is no more valid. Okay. Then the then the process will stop. So that's why the black holes, after spinning down, it will just lie along this critical value or move along this critical spin curve. Yeah. And once the superradiance is uh, and the condition is, uh, uh, I mean, it's no more valid, then the process will stop. Thank you. Well, let's thank Brink again. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I hope you see you all here for our next uh, seminar next week. Thank you. Thank you.